known for many of you. Uh, and for those who don't know him, it's um, Robert Carell, who uh, has been doing, I should say, extensive work on climate change and climate change adaptation. The last one on our field. <laughs> uh, and Bob also was the chair of the Arctic Climate Impact Assessment uh, of the Arctic Council, uh, as many of you will know. Uh, he's uh, the principal of the Global uh, Environment and Technology Foundation. And I'm very proud and glad to say that he also has a part-time professorship at our Ranger Hurdy Institute, the University of the Arctic Data Institute. So, without further ado, I don't know, that this is not on the air yet. No, I think it's mainly for interpretation. So, uh, if we just... Um, with different perspectives and live in the same planet, wake up every morning with some of the same hopes and dreams, but have di different cultural backgrounds. And I want to say something about how what's happening fits into this uh, energy. I hope, oops, the wrong button, Bob. So I want to build on that multiple ways of knowing in the conversation we had this morning. <coughs> um, so they asked me to talk about rapid change and picking points, what's happening. So I want to begin our discussion uh, with some overview stuff. Um, how did we get here? And this next thing is going to take only about two minutes. But for me, it sort of sets the stage. As uh, Warren made a note, I'd like to just have a note. We're going to go back a, a few hundred years to the beginning of the industrial age. And you'll notice that the emissions at that point were only at two or three million gigatons. So it's not a, a metric ton, so to speak. Um, but now watch what's happening in this movie. Now we're going to start in England. Watch the dates and watch the accumulated emissions. And the Industrial Revolution is beginning in England. It's starting to flop. As we get into the 1800s, it starts to move into Germany and France, Western Europe, and <coughs> towards the end, you'll start to see a little bit of emergence of the blue in the United Hemisphere. And watch as what's happening to the emissions. These are carbon emissions. We're grateful too, too fast. Excuse me, sorry. <coughs> you have to use the mic. I have to use the mic. All right. Sorry about that. But you can see we're building. We went, remember, we started at, at two or three or four, and we're now coming up to the present time. And then, I keep pushing the wrong button here. Here's the story. <coughs> on the, on, on the uh, right is your population. To, uh, there was only 100 million people in 1800. I mean, one, one billion people in 1800. Our missions were only seven. And now, we're way beyond the knee of the curve. You know, and you put it right, it's 1955, plus or minus about five years, and everything, you're at the true knee of the curve. And you can see we've gone from two, three, four to almost 10,000. So it's not surprising that the world is having a hard time climatically, physically responding to that reality. This data set scared me, because I did it. I haven't published it yet. I didn't believe that the connection between population and emissions would be so linear since 1955. So I went back and used two and three different data sets, different projections, and they all come out within a few percent of this. And the, the, the thing that amazes me about this is it integrates all emission development, um, when we see a little tick at the end, but it's too soon to say much about what that tick is all about, 
but certainly for a long time it was truly a linear relationship and I chose to stay with that even though we're seeing a sort of turn up at the in more recent years. So this tells us that we have something endemically connected among all the populace, integrating the effect that maybe you do a lot in Europe and the United States, but if you don't bring the rest of the world with you, this thing is probably not going to change very much. So, so there's a remarkable relationship, and the rate of increase you can see is, is almost linear. So <clears throat> you all know that bellwether has been used by a lot of people about our, our Arctic. And so what is happening to sea ice? Anyways, I just want to make the point, there are two regimes. This in regime between 1940 and 1960 is still a basis of argument about why it's mostly natural, but probably the reduction and changes in sulfur in the atmosphere has something to do with it. But we can have a long argument, but you can see we got roughly something of the order of six or so degrees uh, per century as the rate at which this is occurring. This is a relatively recent piece by Kennard and, and group, Lonnie Thompson, the guys who I think are, are the, the heart of our glacial understanding. It takes us back 1,400 years, and it's clear that something remarkable is happening again in this most recent, uh, right, recent period. By the way, any of you see a reference here? You want, uh, same thing as the story that we just got in mid-September on this Arctic sea ice, and just staying with the old rate, you're still looking at something about 10% per decade in terms of the re reduction in, of the extent of sea ice, remembering that the next slide, or probably not here. Here's the story, you've seen it, um, but I wanna get this idea of rate into the equation. Things, we got some numbers on them. Uh, if they're linear, then we talk about Something, something per decade. If it's not, then we have to talk about the, uh, the... And this is the story of what happened this last, just this year. A real change in the structure and the behavior. Look over on the left as that sea ice off of Kamchatka just stirring the pot of your drink with the ice in the middle. The faster you stir it, the faster, of course, it'll melt. So we're seeing these changes in weather patterns, but as you all know, these, these gyres or the circumpolar affairs are always uh, a part of the equation, and we could spend some time as to why Europe got cold in light of Greenland being hot. It, the genesis of, of something of this nature. Same thing is true with the age of sea ice. This is starting back with the early work of satellites in the late 70s and bringing us up to the, the scale on the far side. If it's really white, it's real old ice. If it's blue, light blue, uh, it's uh, one or two year old ice. Changes the whole character of the arc, not but had not time to mature into a very, very, so the end result is these one and two year ice is something of the order of a meter or two at most, mostly a little over a meter. And you can see here by the time we get to the present, I'll show it to you in a little different. Here's a story. There's only about 15% of the sea ice left that's older than two years, and most of it's only one, one year, uh, some two year. And as the Chinese found and all the other icebreakers working up there, we don't have to have 75,000 horsepower icebreakers to work in this. We can do it with 15, 20, 25,000. So, and that's what's really spinning up the trade issue, particularly as we look at it from the... Uh, let's go to uh, Greenland. Story's the same story. Classic picture, you've seen it. Usually we put 2007 in there. But things are starting to grow. But here's a picture from 90, uh, 85 to 05. I think you've all seen this picture <clears throat> on, on the 12th of July of this year. In four days, we went from 40% of the surface having at least one day of melting to 97%. Uh, I'll show this a better picture here. 
So in four days it changed, and it stayed that way until we started to go back into the, into the winter. So Greenland is also behaving differently. Not nice, smooth transition that we've been seeing for um, literally decades. And I have a personal experience of flying all over it, landing all over it, and I can tell you what I see there is transformal, and particularly in the last couple, couple of years. All right, let's go on. There's the other side of the story, because we talk about, I'm sorry, I'm standing in front of you. Oh, you can see there. Uh, that's the cheater. That's my cheater. <laughs> um, but what's really important is the volume of ice, and that means we really have to worry about the thickness. And this is probably the best data we have on this. Uh, but it, too, is doing what everything else. So the, I keep want to get this word rate into into our mind. And this builds on a lot of on the things that Johan was talking about this morning. Here's the sea level chart, same story. Um, here's a projection of English speakers and you of about every generation and probably a, close to a half a meter by mid-century. Um, and again, we've got another inc rate of increase. This is probably more exponential, and I want to come back to the exponential con concept because it is, it's scary when you start talking exponentials. Um, but here's what I'm worried about when we talk about how do we connect ecological systems. Um, this is the MDVI. As many of you know who work in this world, we've made a lot of progress. But here are the issues in my... my uh, we're only looking at one kilometer resolution, and a lot of these systems require higher level resolution than that to really understand them. Uh, <clears throat> we do, but we have fewer time series. Nothing like what we have on sea ice or Greenland. We don't have the time series as to what's happening to the biome. There are little spotty things here and there. And there will be a, a new satellite system that will enhance that vegetation index, it, and it will come out it, in that instead of MDVI, it'll be called EVI. So there's something in the breeze here that's going to help this community in the Arctic. But uh, <clears throat> but there are some places where we got, where we are beginning. This is some stuff over in Russia. I think you can all you all anybody has trouble with the maps, raise your hands. But I think you can see we're in the Russian Arctic. And they're now starting to get some sense of what's happening at lower scale, like this is in Yamal. But we have to use models to connect the data parts because they're not, they're not uh, very dense. So w we've got some things going here. But the rate of change is really the dominant player. And here's the projection. Um, we published this just in June, and it's sort of, some people are, don't like it, and you can draw your own conclusion. Um, if you go to the Copenhagen Accord, where the nations of the world all agreed to put into the accord what they are planning to do, not what they're going to do, but they're planning to do like 80% reduction by 2050 in Europe. 80% reduction, 83% reduction by the United States by the same time. You do that for all 107, and you disaggregate it. So, you know, some came from cement, some came from oil, gas, some came from natural sources, and so on. You run that model, this is what you get. We only saved a half a degree from business as usual. Um, and <clears throat> as a consequence, that rate of change is going to give us this kind of an Arctic. If you now, yes, interpreter needs to uh, slow down. OK, thank you. If you take this one step, and now you take this and really run this projection at finer scale, the standard IPCC scale, this is what you get. You're going to have some pretty warm things by mid-century, and the planet's going to be pretty warm pretty substantially. If the countries do that, now they're going to do something really dramatic. At least that's the heart I have about how we're going to do this, because we don't want to be in either one of these worlds. 
and none of the ecosystems and the interactions with you humans, whether it be reindeer herders or fishers in the Amazon, want to live with this kind of, of a world. So those are some of the background. So the rate of change of global temperatures, uh, uh, global surface temperature, I shouldn't say globally, uh, surface temperatures in the Arctic gives you some idea where we are. Now, I, this is a diagram you saw this morning, and I asked uh, Inga Marie if I could have it. Something's going on, because uh, she and I have talked a lot about the NAO and how these spikes for guave is occurring, uh, at least in the history of their understanding. But look what's going on in the life. From a natural process like NAO to some others, I don't know, but that's kind of weird. We got five in the last decade or so. Whereas before, we sprinkled them out with decades between them. So there's some things going on here. And Inga Marie, you're going to have to help me understand how we can take the next steps to better understand. Here's another rate change, but it's drawn a different way. It's drawn by events. And guave is, I've come to learn, this is, this is serious stuff. If you start saying guave this year, they all go ballistic because it doesn't mean very good things for them. So, thoughts on resilience. Um, the alliance, of which has been connected to this, defines the property. I think I don't need to bore you at all. But I want to just say there's some bear makes rate a prominent feature, uh, but I would argue we have to better learn how to monetize that rate. We know it's there, but monetizing, putting numbers on it, things we can do analysis is a challenge of the future. <clears throat> Second has to do with this adjustment and coping, adapting capacity. How resilient is it? You know, I talk about resilience as a, a cue system for you to, guys and gals who do a lot of signal processing. If the thing is very sensitive, it's very sharp. Things go to hell in a bucket. You want something that's got some lateral character to it, so you got some adjustment room. And those are the kinds of things we want to build into the analytical part of our work with uh, resilience. And lastly, and that's a part of resilience as well. So that's kind of the background. So next is, I'd like to posit some ideas. I would argue that our current methodologies have done a really remarkable job over literally a couple decades, uh, giving us real insight into the past and even what's happening now. You notice I haven't said things about tomorrow, but it's done a really good job. Uh, and I would argue that we would, and I'm going to try to convince you with this argument in a minute, that in dealing with this coupled rate dominant system, there are three elements that make mat that matter: the environment itself, <coughs> the economies, and the energy provides the lights, it provides the heat, the cooling, and the like. And a positive, substantial need to add some new methodological tools to the process so that we can better integrate and interconnect the elements that are among the environment, economy, and the uh, global. <coughs> Uh, demand for energy. So, let's go there. First, let's talk about this, what I call the, I'm not the only one that calls it the big E's, environment, energy, and economy. And let's talk about how that fits in. And then secondly, I want to say some things about scenarios. So, what are the new tools? <coughs> Here's the environment. I'm, I'd like to ask you now, Look in this room, and you tell me one thing in this room that did not. Everything that has made this uh, Anthropocene period run into this rapid growth is the ability to have these things that we get out of the environment, including the, the air and the water and oil and gas and everything else, and the metal and the concrete, all came from there. I like to define the environment as that. I turn that yellow coin upside down, and on the other side of that is how we manage that. 
And that's how we get in trouble with climate, how we get in trouble with water quality, because we as a global family aren't doing very well to keep that thing that made it possible for humans to develop the way we have, particularly in the last thousand years. Energy. By the way, I put all the curves on there. You know, I, I think a kind of hockey sticks, if you will. And it's both the energy source and the use. So first of all, how we get it and then how we use it is another feature. <clears throat> and then the economies. Do I have to say anything about that? We're living in a, a very dynamic period in the economy, and it's not at all clear that there are pathways back the way that we have, say, in the United States in the 30s when we had a big depression. I would... I think there's plenty of evidence that we have some difficulties there. So from what I would argue, it's clear there are national interests, how people behave, decisions they make within their culture or within the demographic region in which they live that all interact to these things. So let's run a little experiment. Um, I, I met recently here in North and I asked the minister who had just retired from the job of being the minister of an of uh, energy, um, uh, trade and industry, I think that's the right title, close. I said, what would you like your economy to be in terms of GDP growth, which is kind of the measure, as inadequate as it is, it's the measure ever since uh, a little meeting in northern New Hampshire back in the 40s said, we'll use GDP and here's the way we do it, to measure our economy, what would you like it to be? He said, oh, it's got to be three or four. I said, a number. He said, three and a half. I said, how long will it take your country, Norway, to double its GDP? He looked at me and he said, I have no idea. How could you do that? You've got to run the mathematics. I said, no, no, no. It's real simple. Three and a half into 72 and you get 20 years. And suddenly I say, you're going to want more of that, more of this. You want more of that energy more of that economy, and these things are, are like the butterfly effect. You push one of them, and they all move. And that's one of the things I would argue we need to get back into our equations, and I want to throw a couple ideas about how to do that. So, uh, the new tools. Am I still going too fast? Probably am. Here's how we take care, here's what GDP does. It allows us to connect and assess and track our national market values between, say, energy and our economies. Those are inexorably linked. They're connect externalities. And we didn't want to deal with them somehow because we go, oh, we don't know how to measure them. Well, the, the jit digs up on that one. So let's look more at this GDP thing. Uh, it is a gross national product, and it measures national income, savings, and wealth. It only measures some things that there are transactional capabilities of tracking. It's not the whole game. Not the whole game at all. Um, so there is a strong movement now to get us out of that equation. There's been work for about 20 years, off in little corners here and there, but nothing until Rio plus 20, when things dramatically changed. And we started talking about natural capital accounts, which are the externalities that we have forget. We're in a place where there are very substantial economies whose GDP are darn good. So we can't argue that we're dealing with a tough problem in the yellow. We're dealing where the action really is. So in a way, and I think Johan and several of you said, you know, this is the place where the action is. This is the place we can learn. We can learn about how we do it, that the rest of the world can kind of watch us because the dynamics here are trackable. We have institutions that don't exist anyplace else. I have been asked, would you help us do an ACIA in Amazonia? Ain't going to happen. We can't get the seven countries to even talk to each other let alone have an institution, and there's no indigenous people's connection, blah, blah, blah. So we're, we're playing in a game where, in fact, we got... So let's go back to this diagram. So we got GDP tracking that. Now let's put in 
natural capital. And I'll come back as to what I mean by that and put those accounts in and we'll connect the environment. It, this is one of those infrared things and we'll connect those. So I want to talk a little bit about how we might now start having tools by which we cannot argue philosophically but actually do it. So what are natural capital accounts? <clears throat> it's what everybody has wanted. We took a step for it in the UN by adopting the system environmental economic accounts some time ago. And in, in Rio plus 20, a whole group of, thank you, a whole group of time, we've got to do it. And 27 uh, countries now have embedded in law, and Sweden, you're part of that game are responsible to develop natural capital accounts. So among the Arctic nations, we got three, Denmark, Sweden, and Finland. In Norway, you got one foot in the equation because you like to behave as a part of it, but you like to stay out of it. But you know what? If you're going to trade with Europe, you're going to have to have natural capital accounts because that's going to be part of the game. So it's a new ball game, in my view. Um, and that's what it does. It takes care of those things. We have always argued about pollination of cloud, you know, the whole ball game, uh, water and so on. So this is the new ball game. And what I would argue for us here, it's going to take a little time but this is a new data source. This is where numbers are going to come about, where we will have the tools to do the externality analysis that we could not have done and was not able, were not able to. I, I said to one of my colleagues in the U.S., it's going to take 10 years. He said, absolutely not. The fact that Europe said it will be done, U.S. will have to follow, absolutely have to follow. It's going to be a fight like you've not seen in a long time because it's a very threat to those people who want to protect the fact that if you only do income accounts, you can kind of run a country. But we can't run the countries that way anymore. For a bunch of science types, we can live with that. We can get it into SEI. You guys will have it at SEI. You probably already have it, do you? Some of it? Some of it? You know, um, this is not... Uh, drop names, but an unusual occurrence. I, I was arriving in Alta the other night, and I was asked to talk to Al Gore on his new book. He always checks with all of us. Is this number right? Is this trend right? Have I got the words? We spent a couple hours on the phone, and I asked him about this. He said, Bob, in 1993, I was just become vice president, and Clinton and I ordered our Treasury Department to develop natural capital accounts. In 1996, with a new very, we have actually two years of work on it in the US that we could probably pick up on. It was probably pretty elementary. But you can see the level of resistance is very, they're not going to, this is not something that's going to be easy. But I think we're going to see a whole variety of, that's why I'm telling you about it. Let's put that into our quiver shouldn't affect what you're doing immediately here, but I think it might be useful to start talking about this as you go to 2015 and start talking about there's going to be some new things on the horizon, some new methodological tools to build resilience understanding that we have historically not been able to do. So much. One more I got to do with you, and then I'm going to sit down. I want to talk about scenarios. <coughs> um, I think everybody here in this room has talked at one time or another about scenarios. And let me just say this. IPCC and that whole community, the global energy assessment people, they'll do global scenarios for us forever. And they'll do a good job. And they will be relevant at, you know, hundreds of scale, hundreds of kilometer scales, because that's what we're going to be running our, our models. Even if we get better 50 kilometer scale, but it'll be global stuff. And, and those globals get rid of mountains, get rid of lakes, and get rid of livers, and they kind of have to smudge all that in some way to get it to work. And it does work pretty well. Then we have downscaling. And downscaling has now become mature enough 
that it's being used quite frequently. That gets us down to 10 kilometers. In some cases, we've even gotten to one. So that's going to tell us something about how the climate system is behaving. So we need some scenarios that nest in the locale. So we've got global scenarios, downscale scenarios. Now we need something to work in Caltecano. And let me tell you a little story to give you a sense there are tools emerging for that purpose. All right, what are these new tools? All right, I'm going to take you to Assateague Island, the national seashore, part of the U.S. National Park System. And a young woman by the name of Lee Welling said, we have to help ourselves to deal with almost 400 national parks that are confronted with climate change in every imaginable setting. They're, I'll put it simply, they're the caltecanos of the, our entire country. Each one of them differs from the tools by which we might be in to say what's going on here. So <clears throat> it's, it's a very interesting place. Um, corrosion is ra raising hell with it. We already know there's some effects, so it was a place to experiment. And the superintendent, the top dog in the place, is responsible to submit a 25-year plan, never before included climate change. So uh, then you begin to say, well, what? I can't. I'm sorry. You've got you to decide what you worry about, what are the parameters. You've got to start to say, what do you expect to happen? And you can use your, um, your cl downscale climate if you want to, to give you some sense. And you've got to have some sense of what your confidence levels are. You know, it's the old story. It's stuff we do all the time. But, so that's sort of doing your homework. And then you begin to identify what the drivers are. You know, sea level, storm intensity, those sorts of things are going to be in our, in our face. And then you tease out how this system works. This is the generic model. It's called the four quad scenario. It was developed by Shell. The Shell Oil Company, coming out of 1973, said, we have to have scenarios of the future with a lot of resilience, a lot of elasticity. And uh, uh, P uh, Peter Schwartz and a whole bunch of guys, all of whom you now know because they're all over the place, um, doing things like um, uh, uh, the group that founded the European uh, Climate Foundation. At any rate, that's going to affect our future. And you would sit in a room like this. Nobody else does it but the, the community of people who have to deal with it. And in this case, it says, well, it's the leadership and the degree of societal concern. And then you, you begin to say, at one scale, what happens if that's a heightened urgency or it's not very good or you got real, real good leadership and you got really lousy leadership, things of this nature. So you begin, and now let me take you to Assateague and do the same thing. Here we are at Assateague. That's what ASIS means. Here the dominant players are the intensity of the storms, because this is a place that could erode away overnight, like uh, the islands off of Alaska, and sea level. Those be a. And you begin to say, we've got a lot of storms, few storms, high rates of sea level rise, low rates, and you define four quarters and you begin to, I d then you sit down and you take all those parameters and downscaling and you begin to identify what it would look like and, what, and they all get names like sandbar, drowning, shifting sand. You give them some names so you know what you're talking about. Um, and, and it works. I want to tell you a story. So as a consequence of putting this in place, we chose four, pla four parks to run the experiment. And I want to take you to Joshua Tree. Jo that's what Joshua Tree National Park looks like. That's what a Joshua Tree looks like. And we ran this experiment. We did the four quad. And we went, it does, it allows you to tease that out. And the conclusion was the Death Valley Desert would be sliding southward as we get more and more drought. Desert in the south would be coming north, squeezing Joshua Tree, 
temperatures would go up, precip would go down, the trees would move up slope in the mountains. The, uh, the superintendent said, that's bullshit. There's, that's not, it's not going to happen. It can't be that way. How could you guys ever know that? But he was, he was a little taken. So after the meeting where we laid this all out, he sent two of his biologists, go have a look, see what's going on. They found Joshua trees at 2,000 feet up the mountainside already. He is a believer. And, and today, all national parks have to use a scenario planning to beginning to move into this. Um, this group has, has really worked hard at a multiple set of styles. And if you would like to engage somebody who's really lived a scenario thing, uh, Lee Welling would be a great party to, for one of our session, L-E-I-G-H. All right, so that tells you a little about that. All right, so here's my summary of thoughts. So we really are facing some pretty tough realities. I would, I would argue that we should begin to frame not only environment and people, but our energy and our economies into the equation because they matter. And so we need to know more, take the three E's along, better understand our threats, this is old stuff to all of you. Begin to really open up the range of issues that we can address by the give credence to a more sustainable op uh, opportunity space where we can actually say, look, this is going to work and here's how we can do it. And, and lastly, keep uh, a solution focus on our face all the time. So with a little luck, you see, they, they won't even let me shut down. <laughs> That's funny. There we are. Thanks. I appreciate it. <clears throat> yes. Thank you, Bob. Um, I think uh, you gave us all some, some uh, perspectives uh, about what we're trying to do here these days, from the big E's to uh, some new data and tools. If it's introduced, like you say, it's it's going to change this whole ball game um, and your your way of thinking around the four quad scenarios and so on. Um, so thank you. I uh, would uh, like to go over to the the next uh, presentation. It's by Paul Overwang. Is that right? Good enough. Good enough. Who is from? Uh, the Alfred, Alfred Wegener Institute in Germany uh, that do a lot of work on uh, the Arctic, the Antarctic, and uh, oceans. And um, Paul is a physical scientist uh, who has been working uh, particularly on uh, permafrost and Arctic coast. So, the coastal system. Please, Paul. You have, you have to hold the mic. I don't think I can do better than you did. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to switch gears a little bit. Um, I'm one of the, I'm from the Alfred Wegener Institute in Germany, first of all. My name is Paul Overduin. And uh, Germany is not an Arctic nation, but they have a commitment to polar research. And um, as I understand it, when they heard about the Arctic Resilience Report project, they were adamant they wanted to be involved. And um, I think our contribution is mostly in the biophysical realm, not so much on the social side of things. So I've become a, a contributor to the, the middle part of the report on thresholds. And what, I, what I'd like to talk about are thresholds, and I'm, I'm having a hard time with it. Martin sort of explained why I'm having a hard time with it this morning. Every time I pick out a threshold or a process where I think this is a threshold, I look at it, turn it over, look at it from the other side, and I think, yeah, for whom is it a threshold? Or at what scale is it a threshold? And any threshold I can pick apart, and it's no longer a threshold. So um, what I'd like to do is talk about something that you mentioned, which is linkages between ecosystems and how that can lead to a threshold situation. 
and I'm focusing on the Arctic coast, the whole Arctic coast. And at the end, I hope to talk just for one or two. I was standing in a department store in uh, Germany in the department with the televisions. There was a whole wall of televisions. And so I saw a hundred pictures of this house falling into the ocean. And uh, that was the point when I realized Arctic coastal erosion has reached Germany, has reached the department store where I'm shopping for whatever. It wasn't a TV. And uh, so there's something about that story. I think that we all know, we all know Arctic coastal erosion is a problem. We all know that it's increasing because that's what the media tells us. There are, there's a lot of Arctic coasts, 34% of the coastline of the, of the earth, and they're affected by permafrost, which affects 25% of the land mass in the northern hemisphere. They're not eroding that fast. They're on average about a, that's an important point. I'll get back to it. And there are a lot of communities in the Arctic that exist on the coast from the marine world. They, they li have a lifestyle that depends on their access to the marine realm. So there's a relevance for people living in the Arctic. I'm going to start at a more local scale to look at what does the, coast, the Arctic coast look like from my perspective and why is it important. The picture on the left here, there are some people down here and we have a cliff that's about 25 or 30 meters high and it's about 80 to 90 percent ice. It's pure ice, as pure as you want to get. All of these surfaces that you see here are glistening, melting ice. And at this location, am I going too fast? Yes. At this location, um, the retreat rate, and it's a high cliff. That's a lot of material that's being moved every year. It doesn't make a lot of sense because the Arctic coast only erodes for two or three months of the year. The rest of the time, it looks like this. There's no erosion going on. So not only is it faster than in the south, it's doing it in two or three months instead of all year. So if we change the length of summer, we're going to do something drastic to coastal erosion in the Arctic. What processes, what drivers are important here? Here's my little cartoon. The air temperature is going to affect the ice retreat rate. The energy balance at the surface, how much heat is going into the Earth's surface relative sea level rise. If I lower my land surface, it's like raising the sea, sea level. So that also has an influence on how fast coastal erosion occurs. And then the sea ice is extremely important. The less sea ice I have, the further back it is, the stronger the waves can throw themselves at the beach and make erosion. So. I'm going to talk a little bit about the drivers later and how they're changing, although we've seen it in two talks already today. At this location, this is an example of the erosion rates that we've been measuring since about 1950. Um, we don't have much data in the past, but in the recent future, sorry, I should explain, zero means it's not changing, and the faster it retreats, the lower down the point goes. We call, you can imagine perhaps there's an increase. That may have to do with local factors. I want to put this into a context of, of the whole system now and identify. Okay, yeah, I'll try. I'll put some breaks between the sentences. I want to put this in a, um, a larger context, the dynamics of the Arctic coast. And I've identified three processes that will drive this system. And there are yellow arrows here. The first one is sea ice, as I mentioned. If it goes back, we get increased and affect the, sto uh, the shore. There's also a timing aspect. The longer that it's sea ice free, the longer we have to erode the coast. The second arrow is uh, sea level rise. And as you can see here, I've got a community 
on shore, on the coast, and they're being affected by, by rapid sea level rise. They've been built at a place, or cultural sites have been established at a place with relatively uh, stable sea level. And now that's changing, so now they have to choose. Do we accommodate the changes? Do we adapt to the changes? Do we try to prevent effects? And the third process, expecting the marine to be dealt with in a different talk, the third process is the transfer of material from land to ocean. And that's probably going to have the biggest effect, and it's probably going to be a threshold effect. I'll just move on. So I want to talk about some of the drivers. I'm just going to mention them because we've seen them before uh, today. This is a map of sea level height and it, the, the rate of change. And uh, the mean is about three millimeters per year. And there's no data up in the Arctic. So uh, it's not so useful for us, but it's a similar situation. These are based on observational air temperatures, which, and it's the Arctic that we need to worry about. And the third factor is permafrost. On the left-hand side, I have a picture of the distribution of permafrost, and there are some dots there which are sites where permafrost temperature has been measured. And regardless of where we measure, we see either warming over the last uh, three decades, or if the permafrost is already warm, we see constant temperatures. And these constant temperatures are another threshold. Um, it doesn't mean nothing's happening there. It means that ice is turning into water at zero degrees. And that's the real threshold. And I'll talk about the implications of that for land to ocean transfer. A direct implication of permafrost thaw is that we don't just have coastal erosion at the coast, but in the hinterland behind the coast, we can also have erosion. And this can affect large areas far away from the coast, mobilize carbon, mobilize water, and change the amount of material that goes into the ocean. This is a cartoon designed by a scientist uh, showing how we understand the situation, permafrost situation, from, a, from the continent to the coastline out onto the continental shelf. What does the permafrost do? It has, for the climate system, for the physical system, it has three functions that I'd like to talk about. The first one is it stops water from going into the ground and it keeps water flowing over the surface. The second one is it changes the vegetation at the surface of the, of the, of the land. So it changes how gas, uh, greenhouse gases are exchanged between land and atmosphere. And the third thing it does that's climate relevant is it can trap carbon. It traps carbon at the top. It can trap uh, gas hydrates or methane inside and beneath the permafrost which is another threshold that I won't talk about. I would like to do one thing with this picture. Uh, it's exaggerated. If we assume that Lake Baikal, we have about 1,500 kilometers from here to there. So the vertical exaggeration of this picture is about 200. I'm going to show you what it looks like with no vertical exaggeration. So that's what it looks like with no vertical exaggeration. So I think this is instructive because we talk about scale. And it's important to remember that what's happening at the coastline here, it's difficult to connect what's happening here. Why should permafrost here be affecting what's here? And that's where the teleconnection uh, between these two areas comes in. This is a map, again, 
of sea ice. But I want you to look, orienting myself, I want you to look here across that transect that I just showed you. What happens in spring? I'll play it once more. Now you know where you have to look. Okay, that's our transect, and now we look at it down here. What happens in the spring is that melt begins in the south, of course, first, providing water, and along with that melt, the water, actually I want to look here, moves forward to the sea more or less in one instant. So these rivers draining into the Arctic Ocean have what we call a nival or a snow melt regime. There's a big pulse of water comes through in the spring, and almost no flow in the winter. That's the current situation. But if you imagine the permafrost progressively melting, you're creating a deep groundwater reservoir. That water has to move through groundwater, and you're going to move from a sharp, nival <coughs> uh, spring flow regime that I show here with all the water coming out in the spring. You're going to start bringing that peak down, making it earlier in the spring, and increasing your base flow in the winter. These are data for the last three decades. What we do see is an increase in the winter base flow. You see a change in where the water gets, how the water gets from the south into the ocean. In addition, there's data showing that the amount of water is increasing. So not only are we increasing the amount of transfer, we're, we're changing how the season delivers that water. Here's a picture of the delta where that comes out. Um, I don't remember what day it's from, but you can see that water is being dumped into an icy ocean. It's going through a delta that's frozen. Deltas are productive places, usually, the Mississippi Delta. That's where we have animals, plants, filtering out energy and nutrients and being very productive. In this case, the delta is not ready for what's being delivered. There to be a great increase in the productivity up there. I have two pictures here, one showing sediment here around the shore from coastal erosion, and one showing sediment being discharged through a river mouth. The point is, we should be getting an increase of fresh water to the shelf seas, an increase in carbon, an increase in nutrients at a time when the ecosystems can use it. And that's going to have an influence on what species live where, when they live there. And for us, the question is, how do we capture that? And this morning it occurred to me that people hunting or using uh, macro farm, our migration patterns changing, our life history changing, is the amount of hunting changing, or how we harvest on a subsistence basis or any basis, is that changing? And that's an indicator, and I think that's where our threshold's going to be. At some point in the next decades, we will see a change in how these rivers function, how they uh, seasonally, and that will affect ecosystems. And there is the big question about um, how do you adapt. There's also the issue of carbon. It's not just about ecosystems, it's also about the climate system. There's a lot of carbon in permafrost compared to other uh, carbon stockpiles, and the question is what happens to that carbon? So I'm almost finished. Back to my three pictures. I identify three drivers. And I looked at them, are these thresholds that we need to worry about? I don't know, maybe you can say more about sea level, whether that's a threshold. It sounded like exponential rise is a, is a possible scenario. It's a possible scenario. Um, but the land to ocean transfer 
and its effect on shelf ecosystems is probably going to be a threshold scenario, which will demand uh, some kind of response from the communities on the coastline. And finally, I wanted to ask a, a, a question, a provocative question, I think. There are changes happening already and not. And who adapts? People who live there, but also the economic interests. And this year, uh, for the first time, major gas and oil companies have moved into the lap dev scene and started to explore with large 3D seismic systems. So we have oil and gas here that provides Europe. When I cook, I use gas from this peninsula. They have a lot of money, and they're moving into here. This year was the first year that there was drilling in the Chukchi. So at least on the American side, the leases have been given out, and drilling has begun. So we almost have the entire Arctic Ocean already being used for natural resources. And my contention is that are those with economic power. And uh, that's the oil companies. The biggest changes in Siberia right now are the oil companies. And for me, the question is, uh, is that part of it? Is that part of our resilience as a, as a, as a group, as a, as a race, as a species? Now that I put up an advertisement for our State of the Arctic Coastal Report, um, which isn't an official Arctic Council document, but tries to gather these things together also from a socio-ecological uh, perspective. So we t try to take a look at what's happening to the Arctic coast, um, finished up in, in 2011. And it's available at arcticcoast.org. Thanks very much for your attention. Ah, yes, thank you, Paul. Uh, you said that uh, coastal erosion had reached Germany. I think it just reached Guadalcanal, too. Uh, and uh, thank you for your most uh, thought-provoking uh, speech. It's, it seems you're quite um, focused that the land to ocean transfer is, is really what we, we ought to focus on. And uh, at the end, I, I, I see also that this uh, in depth on the activity and analysis of uh, oil uh, major streams. So I think it's one of the big trends here. Yeah. Yes. So, following up on your question, I, um, we now propose that uh, we could have a uh, um, And uh, it, it's very tempting then to, uh, to challenge the. Uh, the audience on, on your, your uh, final uh, remark or question, uh, who adapts quickly and is it a part of what we're thinking? But um, anyone who has questions for today's presentations and, and the speakers are, are welcome to, uh, to, uh, to shoot off. I think uh, Anika was the first one. I, I would have to ask you when, yeah, use the microphone. We can put the microphone over on the side so you... Uh, you I, th I think one of the things that really bugs me is that we have been so incredibly successful. The drivers have changed, but also some of the thresholds and some of the biophysical processes. And we know very well that there is something happening. There's no question about that. We have, as you showed, we have some parts of the systems reacting, uh, the economic systems in terms of uh, oil exploitation and new opportunities. What we don't have reacting in our systems are the governance systems that ideally would respond to the situation and say, hey, we have to do something differently. Uh, and, and our... My question, I think, because I don't have an answer, what, what is it that in the governance systems, uh, the whole governance architecture from global to local level in an adequate manner to, 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 to the challenges? 
I think that's one of the, not, not only kind of from a policy point of view, but actually from a scientific understanding point of view, how the systems are, decision-making systems are functioning. So, Bob, I know you worked with a lot of decision-makers, so I wanted to put that question to you. What, how, do you how do you see in your systems, because we have the economic systems without anyone making decisions, as it appears, right? We have the biophysical systems without anyone making decisions. But somewhere we're making decisions. You, you put me on the spot on something that is, in my view, going to be the, this is the uh, unbreachable unbre threshold. It's there. Boom. There's been a fair amount of work about how humans respond to, to challenge of change. And it's pretty clear now um, that we all, f most of us fall into the gray zone, but some of the most powerful people fall into one or, or two camps. One camp is adapting to change, absorbing change, using their, their uh, mental capacities to respond to it and adjust to it. But there's another, another party, and I would, if for anyone that's interested, I will send you an email that has only about a half a page of bullets on exactly this issue. You can call it um, liberalism and conservatism, but it's not intended to be a party or a political operation. It's how we humans behave. And um, it's now clear, increasingly, conservative. That is, we don't want to respond to change. And when change is confronting us, we're looking for ways around to deal with it. We're, we're trying to find those mechanisms. Um, the, the Jost study of 2003 and all the stuff since then really bring home the fact that we're going to have to think differently about our message. There are, at least in the U.S., upwards of half of the people are not going to listen to rational arguments from scientists. They just can't do it. It's, it's, in, it's innate in their being. Uh, there's a huge amount of research to justify it. The, the classic case was 23,000 subjects over five years looking at how that behavior using every imaginable technique, some of which use these functional MRIs that help understand what part of them do not want to change. When the change is the game, then we're going to have to find ways to work it into, into their arena. I don't know how to do that, but I, what, what shocks me is it's real. And if I were to read you the words, you're saying, oh, I've seen that, I've seen that. In fact, if I may, I'll read you a couple words. Um, See if I can get it out of my... Um, in aggregate, conservatives and liberals divide on the way they extend beyond this, these realities some from very deep psychological and almost genetic needs. Those are statements out of paper after paper after paper. It's papers that people don't want to listen to. You can imagine what's going on in the United States on this issue right now. It doesn't take much thinking. In summary, those whose brains are really facile, they have a lot of resilience in them. They are the agents of change. Those are the, that's where change comes on the planet. By the way, this, these studies are not just U.S. There's 20 countries in, involved in the Joe study. Con conservative way of thinking universally resist change. And you can actually d diagrammatic, I mean, deal with the details of it. So, Annika, I, I appreciate your question. I don't know the answer. I'm having trouble with my own community in the United States recognizing that publishing, creating, derived products that have beautiful graphics about how things work, the blinders come up. They're not physical blinders. They're blinders do not want to absorb that information because it's creating a new reality they don't want to go to. I was born in the cornfields of Illinois. I can tell you those people do not want change. They do not want the fact that they're going to have to raise their corn differently or they're not going to have the kind of products that they used to have. They're mining the environment. They're mining that soil. If you want a word about the environment, use the word we are mining it. And I'm not talking about minerals. I'm talking about all the other things. In the United States today, if I go buy broccoli, it is only 27% of the nutrients that my parents 
got when they bought broccoli. Because we've mined those things out of the soil in a way that we haven't replaced it. So that kind of thing really makes people mad. I mean, they want to kill us over having those kind of discussions. So we have to jump over to their road. And I actually don't know. I think the answer to it is, is doing more of what we're doing, but maybe putting it uh, in ways that address some of those deep psychological needs that some people have. Remember, I, I'm a physical oceanographer. I feel like I'm way out of my element here. But I've been reading on this and studying it, and we have workshops and stuff. I think it's real, and we're going to have to contend with it. Conference upside down here, you know. <laughs> uh, no, no, that's good. Uh, but but uh, uh, partly what I have to say it's related to Bob Bob's uh, argument, of course. I mean, because has made uh, the Arctic as part of the global economy. Most people look upon this as uh, as an opportunity. I mean, uh, uh, people don't care about, the polar bear doesn't really matter in the big picture, not even Kertukeno, you know. Uh, and and uh, so the Arctic has, and we asked for it for a long, long time, that Arctic should be a part in the global thinking, and now it has become a part of the global economy. And my worry is then that, are we going to have a homeland for the Sami people then in future, in that setting? Uh, and I, I think that uh, very careful and, and the way we are going to work, yes, we were, it's two years ago we raised the debate here in this room about the ethics of selecting the right knowledge for the future. That's where you are touching on it. What is politics and what's knowledge? And we believe that the Reindeherder's knowledge is as good as knowledge as me coming from the South, taking my university degree in Tromsø. But, but that's where we are, you know, and it's a big, big fight. Uh, uh, and... Uh, and uh, in your talk, Bob, um, you showed in Marie's uh, boot curve. Oh, the boot curve. You know? That she was talking about bad grazing years for reindeer here in this society for the last hundred years, 12. But you saw it was a boot, went like this. But I, 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 I she went just out. I, I, I come back to that. Is that because of the battle of knowledge and my part as a natural science is the winning part, you know, uh, in that battle, that there has been a, a of knowledge that 100 years ago people were not so uh, afraid of a bad grazing year. Yes, they could be very, very bad, also in 1917, but that very quickly on bad years. So, so it's, you see, I mean, that's my worry. I, I, I'm not so worried about you, Hans, all these boot curves. I'm worried that the local knowledge is not an opportunity anymore, you know. And that touches against, uh, towards Bob's argument too about ethics. And this is, uh, that's, that's resilience down to its basic core understanding, you know. That's where, if reindeer herders could allow to use their own knowledge, if we could use the Sami language, we will increase biodiversity in Finnmark. I have a big problem, big problems, but I think that's what it matters. The Arctic has become a part of the global economy. Yes, there also is an opportunity for the Sami people. 
if we build the resilience in the society, but that, that have to be done locally. And there is all these other things that we see the erosion of the knowledge, which has been here for 10,000 years. That's my worry. And, and I can't see, Martin, in your method this morning, uh, that you're capturing that in your methodology. I think you are absolutely right that so far we aren't capturing it. What we will try to capture it is what I was talking a little bit about this, this, the question I raised. W how do we understand governance? I used the word governance. We heard this morning about CEDA concept, which is also another conceptualization of decision-making processes in relation to the people around us and the physical environment around us. That is what governance is about. And I think understanding those processes at both the local level but also in relation to national policies and in relation to international politics is essential and that we're hoping we're getting it a little bit in the presentation from Gary. You're very correct in that. But connecting the knowledge of governance in traditional settings to the more formal knowledge of political governance, I think, is an essential part. Yeah, quickly. I think uh, I wanted to give a bit more of a positive outlook. Uh, bring it maybe back to the to the Arctic Resilience Report because uh, I I very much agree with everything you said. You know we have been uniting forces sometimes in in trying to get exactly this change done over the last five years uh, to disentangle uh, climate and energy and to 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 find uh, many ways forward here to to um, to move to a new way of of managing and governing. Um, but I think uh, we are trying to do too many things at the same time because we, we think we need to. And I, that's the reason why I want to actually, uh, that, can, that can make things change. And, and uh, so coming back to your 